Are you in Esther chapter 4? I'm going to be reading from verses 7 to 14. It's a lengthy passage, but it's important. Just stay with me and read along. Esther 4, 7 to 14. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Sushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. So Hatak returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Then Esther spoke to Hatak and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and all the peoples, people of the king's provinces know that any man or, or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law put all to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. Watch this. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Glory to God. Glory to God. I want you to look at the person next to you with all the anointing you have and say to them, it's your time now. My God is a now God. He is the great I am that I am. He is not the I was or the I will be God. He is the great I am that I am. And he is the everlasting now God. He is the now God. Everybody say, He is the now God. He is not the God of tomorrow because He says tomorrow will never come. Because when tomorrow comes, it's today. Amen. I said, Your God is a now God. Amen. If you believe that, then say, It's my time now. It's my time now. Amen. It's now. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next month. It's now. Any radical believers that want to make it now? Yeah, well, I, got to, I got to have some radical believers in here. Now, when I look at this passage, you know, I wonder if there is a difference between time for you and you for time. I don't want to mess with your mind too much this morning. It's early, I know that. It's cool and cozy as well. But I'm, I'm just wondering as I look at this passage, I'm just wondering... Is there a difference between time for you and you for time? Now, I understand that all of us in here, because we are creatures of time, something has happened because now we are blended with the God of eternity. And that causes problems because intellectually, the finite mind cannot always comprehend the timing of God. And that's our major problem as Christians because we are creatures of time. We were created in time, placed in time by a God who is out of time. And so when God talks about timing, he doesn't talk it on our level of understanding. And that's the major problem. Because see, God being a God of eternity, he has decided some things and he decided them not in time. That's a problem. 
Our God who is a God of eternity decided some things, determined some things, but he didn't determine them in time. One of the most profound and prolific scriptures is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, where it says that we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. You were not chosen after you showed up your goody-goody self. You were chosen when there was none of you, none of this world, nothing before the foundation of the world, before this world was created, before the galaxies came into being, before there was a sun, moon, and star, before there was any other planet. I'm telling you, God chose you in Christ from before the foundation of the world. That is a powerful, powerful, powerful scripture. And if that doesn't excite you, I don't know what will. That before there was an earth, I was chosen in him. I was not just chosen to go to heaven. I was chosen to be his. I was chosen to be his bride. I was chosen to be his body. I was chosen to be a part of him. I'm glad that I was chosen. Anybody glad that you were chosen? Chosen before the foundation of the world. And the Bible says, and that all spiritual blessings were given in Christ Jesus before you got here. That's powerful. For those of you that are waiting on the blessing, you got to change your theology. Because all the blessings were given in Christ Jesus before you got here. It would ind indicate to me then that everything that is mine... God has already given it before I even got here. Oh, let me say that. Let me say that again. It would, in, it would indicate to me then that everything that is mine, God already has given it to me before I even got here. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like that. It's already mine. Everybody say that. Come on, say it again. It's already mine. Every blessing that God has is already mine. Do you believe that? Now, if it's already mine and it has already been given, then it's not a matter of me trying to get it. It's a matter of it coming to get me. Oh, you missed it. You missed your shouting moment there. Let me backtrack a little bit and try to make it a little more plainer. If you know it's already yours and that God has already given it before you even got here, all right, then that means it's not a matter of me going to get it, the blessing, but it's a matter of it, the blessing coming to get me. How many of you got it? How many of you didn't get it? Let's be honest. How many of you didn't get it? All right. Let, let me say it again. Listen. I am saying to you that God has already given you all blessings you ever need. Before you ever got here, he already made it yours. And your name is written on it and the parcel has been packed and it's on its way to you. It's already yours. Now, if it's already mine and God has already given it in eternity, I don't have to go and get it. It's coming to get me. Now did you get it? Oh my. If I say nothing else, if I just close the sermon now and send you with a benediction, you got your message. Shall we conclude? <laughs> If I say nothing more, I think that's a revelation by itself. I don't have to. Some of the people are begging and rolling on the floor and, you know, trying all sorts of things to get the blessing. And the blessing is saying, hey, you don't have to get me. I got to come and get you because you're already a recipient of the blessing. God has already given it. Why are you trying to get it? Allow it to get you. Uh -huh. Now, the one thing that significantly happens is 
since he gave me something before he made the world, it's got to come to me sooner or later. Amen? Look at your neighbor and say, it's just a matter of time. Yeah, yeah. Look at the other person on the other side and say, it's just a matter of time. That, that's all, that's all. It's just a matter of time, my friend. Just hold on to your, to your seat. It's just a matter of time before it becomes yours. Now, the reason why many people don't go to the book of Esther is because a lot of people keep talking about that if you ever get to read the book of Esther, you will find that the name of God is never mentioned in it. Did you know that? The name of God is not mentioned in the book of Esther. Even though the name of God is not mentioned in it, yet God is the main character in the book of Esther. Uh-oh. I hope you stay with me. God is all over the book from beginning to end, church. He's all over this book from beginning to end, and I'm going to show you in a moment. The Lord is present in every scene and in the movement of every event. Let me say that again. The Lord is present in every scene and in the movement of every event in the book of Esther. And this is such a good reminder for us as Christians. Why do I say that? Because, watch this. Even when it seems that the Lord is not present, indeed he is. I think you didn't get me. The book of Esther is a very good reminder to us Christians. Why? Because even when it seems like the Lord is not present in a given situation of yours, the truth is, He is. It may look like He's not there, but He is. It might, it might look like He's not doing nothing, but He's doing everything. He is orchestrating everything. He is working more harder than your liver does. Stop and think about that. If you know how much your liver works, you know how much God works. He put it in there. Listen, church, you got to understand, even when it looks like God is doing nothing, He is doing everything to make it work for you. That's why Paul says, for we know that all things work together for good to those that love God and to them that are called according to His purpose. All things are working together. All things. Now who's working all things? So God is working all things. If He's working all things, He's working all the time. Because you better know he does, you cannot work all things a few times. If you're going to work all things together for good, you got to keep working all the time. Even when you are not working, God's working. Hallelujah. Even when you hit the bed and go to sleep at night, God is still working on you and working things for you. So that when you do wake up in the morning, you do understand he made it work. That's why the psalmist says, you know, I both lay me down and slept and I woke up and I found he sustained me. He said, the only reason I woke up this morning is because God kept my heart ticking. God regulated my blood pressure. God controlled the organs to do its work. Even when you were sleeping, God was working. I'm glad I have an overtime working God on my behalf. Listen. See, as Christians, we don't believe in coincidence. Am I right? We believe in providence. Coincidence is something that happens by chance. Pro providence is the divine intervention of God, the divine work of God. And I'm telling you, the book of Esther is full of the revelation that God is at work in divine providence. God is putting himself on display 
in amazing ways, even though he is unnamed in the book of Esther. I'm glad that even though the book does not have the name G-O-D in it, but it has his, his work all over it. There is not a comma in the book of Esther that God has not breathed into. Every comma, every comma, every full stop, you know, every exclamation mark, I don't care, whatever it is, everything that God has put in the book of Esther is controlled by him. When you talk about providence, you're talking about sovereignty. When you talk about sovereignty, you're talking about a God who has all the power he needs, all the power he wants to have so that he can control everything up in your life. Amen. The word providence means he is in full control of my life. Glory to God. Are you glad that God's in control of your life? Some of you don't look so. I'm glad he's in control of my life. Uh-huh. <laughs> Somebody lift your voice and say, I'm glad he's in control. Are you really? The book of Esther is a reminder to you of the sovereignty of God. That God is in control of your life. But just because he's in control doesn't mean he will not, you know, he will not allow you to do your work. Just because he's in control doesn't mean, you know, he'll... He'll, you know, drop money in your, in your lap from, from, from the 1st to the 31st. No, he gave you a, an intelligent mind and he gave you a job and he said, go work. He's in control, but he told you to go work. He said, I'll bless the work of your hands. So we see that even though he is unnamed, God is putting himself on display in amazing ways. And God has a purpose for Esther. And her time to fulfill that purpose has come. And God sent me to tell you this morning that he has a purpose for you. And your time to fulfill that purpose has come. You don't look very happy today. Maybe you'll get it before this service is over. That's the thing I love about God, my brothers and sisters. Is that he has this amazing ability to use whomever he wants to fulfill his purpose. And when he has a purpose for you, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what or where you, which place you come from. It doesn't matter what your qualification is. It doesn't matter what your age is. It doesn't matter what gender you belong to. If God has a purpose for you, He has appointed and anointed you to fulfill your purpose and your time to fulfill that purpose is now. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. Your time to fulfill your purpose has come. Your time to beat around the bushes is over. Your time to struggle in life is over. Your time, you know, to try and comprehend and try to keep up with the Jones, so to speak, is over. The book of Esther is a powerful declaration that God has a purpose for each and every one of us. And he has commissioned us today to fulfill that purpose now. Everybody say, it's my time now. Mm -hmm. It's your time now. Let's go to Esther now. Let's work, work and show you, even though the name of God is not mentioned, there's nothing happening in this book. No event that hasn't got his work in it. Esther chapter 1. Esther chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. This was the Ahasuerus who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. 
Verse 2, in those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Sushan, the citadel, verse 5, and when these days were completed, the king made a feast lasting seven days for all the people who were present in Sushan, the citadel, from great to small in the court of the garden of, king, of the king's palace. There were white and blue linen curtains fastened with cords of fine linen and purple on silver rods and marble pillars. And the couches were of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of alabaster, turquoise, and white and black marble. That's, my friend, that's opulence. That's wealth in extremity. That's wealth in abundance. That's a splendid little show of abundance. Watch this. Verse 7. And they served drinks in golden vessels, each vessel being different from the other, with royal wine in abundance, according to the generosity of the king. Uh-huh. So here we get to see a picture of the kingdom of Persia. And Ahasuerus is better known in history as King Xerxes. Some of you who have studied history will understand him. The Persian king as Xerxes. That was his name. Xerxes is, is, a, is, a, is a despotic ruler. That means he is a man who is narcissistic, uh, he is a self-adoring, you know, self-elevating, self-exhorting, spoilt brat. That's who King Xerxes is. He's a man of uncontrollable temper. And he's a man that will, will do anything at any time. You don't know what he'll do. He is given, you know, to his sudden burst of rage and does some of the most insane things. Just to let you know how bad a guy he is, let me tell you, there was a time he was getting ready to attack the kingdom, the empire of Greece. And so he had to go all the way from modern Turkey. And so they had to go over a strait between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. And so he built bridges to cross over. But while the bridges were, were built and completed, a sudden storm arose and, the, and destroyed the bridges. And he was so furious that he thought that the bridges were built inadequately. And that's why it couldn't withstand the storm. So he chopped off all the engineer's head that built the bridge. If that is not enough, watch this man's insanity. He sent soldiers into the ocean with whips. And he said, whip the ocean 300 times for insub insubordination. Are you getting what I'm saying? They went and whipped. You won't believe this. They went and whipped the sea 300 times for being insubordinate to him. And then he sent another band of soldiers to throw shackles or chains into the sea. And he said, change the, you know, imprison the water. Excuse me? This is the kind of ruler... We are dealing with in this place. And the good news is. This bad boy is in the hand of a good God. <laughs> You'll get it when you go home. It does not matter. Who is at the reign. Or who is in control. Because too many people think. They are running the show. Maybe they are running the show. But God is running them. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Okay, verse 11. So he's got all this, you know, wealth and he's got all these, you know, uh, uh, linen curtains and, and gold, uh, you know, uh, ch uh, chalices in which they pour the wine. He's got, you know, mosaic and marble and pillars. Oh my God. I mean, this, this guy is crazy. And he's displaying all this. And in verse 11, he commands his queen Vashti. To be brought before him wearing her royal crown. In order to show her beauty to the people and the officials. For she was beautiful to behold. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command. 
brought by his eunuchs. Therefore the king was furious and his anger burned within them. Now wait a minute. They, this, this, this group, if you read the previous verses, you will find they have been in a drunken orgy, you know, for the last seven days. And after the, on the seventh day of the feast, Xerxes or Ayasuris, after a week of intoxication and indulgence, after, you know, having showed off all the wealth of his palace and his kingdom and his glorious virtue and power, now he is totally intoxicated, lost his mind. Now he wants to display his queen and, you know, reveal her beauty so that the gloating, drunken, you know, mob around him, the princes and the nobles and the officials of the 127 provinces, all drunken people can gloat at her beauty. And so he says, I command you to come and show yourself in your royal regalia, royal emblems, your crown, your dress, your ornaments. Show it off, lady. Show who's your husband. Mm -hmm. Well, surprisingly, she says, no. Somebody say that, please. No. <laughs> you didn't get it. You didn't get it. Say it again, please. No. no. I tell you, my brothers and sisters, this man is a despotic ruler. And a despotic ruler is one who has life and death in his hands. He is somewhat like King Nebuchadnezzar. Gets insane at times. If somebody will whip the sea, you can know how insane he is. Watch this. If that was not enough, if the, if the whipping and the shackles was not enough, watch this. He took iron rods, made it red hot, and began to stab the ocean. Insane man. This, this guy is insane. And I'm telling you, you cannot afford to play with him. When you're around him, you have to be very, very careful. He's crazy. He is hellishly crazy, if I can say that. <laughs> He's not the kind of, you know, fellow that you don't give him what he wants. If he says, come, you better come. And what makes it worse is he's drunk. Dead drunk. Seven days of just drinking and eating and drinking and eating with 127 princes who are totally drunk themselves. And Esther, I'm sorry, Vashti says no. The smallest word in the English language is the word no. And when she said no, she was only concerned about protecting her dignity, her honor, her character, her reputation. For Vashti was a woman of moral excellence. She was a woman who would say no. Let me tell you this. She lost her crown, but she kept her honor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My brothers and sisters, may I say to you today that her no was one of the great God-inspired no's in human history. Because usually, it's not usual for a woman who knows the man she has will chop her head at any time if she does not come when he calls and still she says no she shook the persian empire to its roots king hasuris his macho ego was shaken to the core he was shocked that a woman would say no to the greatest power of the earth at that time he was an emperor he was an emperor with power 
He could do anything at any time. And the entire world of that time that was under his control was a proof of his power. He had total power and oftentimes he used that power cruelly and brutally. And yet this woman was led to say no. It is quite uncharacteristic for a woman like Vashti, the Queen Vashti, to say no to a man that is as crazy and as insane as him. But she did. Why? Because there was a supernatural God overseeing and he said if i'm going to get my weapon back to the palace i need you to go against your own will and say no no is a great word no young ladies young men let me talk to you today the only way you can keep the devil a spectator is when you say no to every temptation that he throws against you. The only way you will stay off drugs and pornography and alcohol and womanizing and manizing is when you have the moral and God-given courage to say no to sin. Listen, you first got to say no to sin before you can say yes to God. I remember going to see my friend in the mental asylum chained because of excessive drug taking. He had come to the place that he had injected him in his in his in his in his legs in his in his in his arms and there, there, there is no more place that has not been injected with drugs. And now he came to the place where he wanted to shoot the drug into his brain directly to get the kick immediately because it was not giving him the kick he wanted. And it was at that time that they, that they, that they said he's too dangerous to let out. And they put him chained and they were drugging him. To keep him asleep because he was very, very violent. 22 years old. A great lead guitarist. An excellent singer. One of the top talents in Chennai. An amazing gifted person. Handsome, if you call it. Fair. I mean, handsome. He, he had... He had, he, had a, 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 he had a personality that will make even the best women turn twice. Meaning no offense. But I'm just trying to make a point. And when I went to see him, he looked at me and he said, Colin, see how I am. If only I had said no in my college first year to that drug that they gave me, I won't be here today. If only I had said no, I won't be chained like an animal. And a few days later, he died. And it never went out of my mind. It broke me. It broke me to pieces. To have seen such a tremendous talent. Because of an inability. And because of no moral courage to say no to the tempter. To say no to peer pressure in college. He died. And none of those college peers who led him to that drug addiction, were there to see him die as an animal. Young people, may I plead with you, God has a purpose for you. Don't let the devil tempt you to try the different angles of sin. You got to come up with that. Oh, no, 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 you got to say it like you. No! no! You got to feel the pain I feel in my heart. Well, I say to you, I'm fighting for your life. I'm not fighting against you. I'm fighting for your soul. I want you to come out and be free from the devil's power because too many young people are hooked on to drugs, are hooked on to alcohol, are hooked on to all kinds of things. But like Vashti, may God give you the moral courage to say no. You might lose your crown, but you can keep your honor. If you say no, you can save your virginity for your husband who's coming. Sorry to be blunt this morning, but I got to make a point. If you say no to, to pornography, 
you will save yourself from committing deeds that are so damnable. If you can say no, we will be not seeing three-year-olds being raped because of men, young guys who watch pornography. Raped a three-year-old till the baby died. Baby! If only they had to say no to porn, that child would have lived. Who knows what that child could have been? Who knows whether she would have grown up to be a woman of valor, of value, of virtue? A girl that could have changed the world. Who knows what she would have been? But these men, these young guys could not say no. Could not say no. I plead with you today under the anointing of God. May God give you the courage to say no. Because if you say no, you will keep your dignity. If you say no, you'll keep your virginity. If you say no, you'll keep your holiness. If you say no, you'll keep your reputation. If you say no, you'll keep your respect. If you say no, you may not go behind bars. You don't have to end up in a, in a, in a uh, correction facility. You don't have to go to jail. If you can only say no, I'm telling you, when the tempter comes, I want you to say a resounding no and let the four walls echo your no to the world. She said no. Her honor was more important to her than her head. She was beautiful, gorgeously beautiful. But let me tell you this, without character, without integrity, without dignity, all your beauty is worthless. Your color, your complexion, your physic means nothing. It's worthless if you have no character. She knew that. She was gorgeously beautiful. But more than her beauty, she was a woman of character. And she said, no! She said, no. She knew that her head could be taken off. But she said no. I'm telling you. When you say a God inspired no. God will preserve your life. To leave you as a testimony for the world. To imitate later on. She might not have been a covenant person. But God kept it as a reminder. That if an unsaved non-covenant person. But by his moral power was able to say no, how much more should the blood wash, word believing, spirit filled young Christian say no to peer pressure, say no to your, 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 to, to, your, to your people who tried to seduce you, say no to everyone who promises you that if you will compromise a little bit, you can get the world. If you say no, God will come to your rescue. Three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were confronted by the king Nebuchadnezzar. He loved these guys. He liked them because they were some of the best in his, in his, in his country. And so he gave them a second chance. He said, I'm giving you one more chance because I like you guys. I know how good you are. I know how, how smart you are. One more chance. Is it true that you won't bow to my gods? Did you say that? Is it true? He said, yes, king. Yes, king. He says, okay, I'm going to give you one more chance. I'm going to have all those instruments play. And when it plays, I want you to bow down to my image. They said, sorry. What did they say? No. I'm not getting it like I wanted to you from you today. They said, N O King. He said, What? Say it again. They said, No. 
And the Bible says he became so furious, he heated that furnace seven times more. And, you know, the guys who threw them in died. But these guys were thrown in bound. But when Nebuchadnezzar looked up, he found that there was a fourth man in the furnace because you can never say a no for God and God not show up with you in the fire and when he shows up with you, he'll keep you from everything that will destroy. All you got to do is say no. 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 And God showed up for them and said, they that honor me, I will honor them. Another man that I can think of that said no was Joseph. The Bible calls him beautiful to look at. Did you know that? The Bible calls him beautiful to look at. So don't look at me quizzically. Man, beautiful. I know women are beautiful, but men are handsome. Pass. I, I don't blame me. You go and look at the Bible. The Bible called him beautiful. He was beautiful to behold. That's what the King James Version says. And here was this beautiful guy. And... Uh, you know, Pharaoh's official's wife, she had an eye on him. Shame on her. Another man's wife, and she's eyeing another man apart from her husband. Shame on this lady. And she kept, you know, telling him, come lie with me. And he looked at her and said, Oh, I'm not getting it still. After so long of preaching, you can't say that no yet. My God. He said, I know you don't like me today, but I don't bother. <laughs> I like you anyway. But the fact is, she caught her hand. She thought if, if words were not enough, maybe the touch will work. And she caught hold of him. And he said, have my coat, lady, not me. Vashti lost her crown. Joseph lost a coat, but both of them kept their honor, and God showed up for them. He ran out of that place. He ran. Don't think you're anointed and stay and think, no, Pastor, if a girl comes and holds me, I'll rebuke. Mm -hmm. Forget it. It won't work. Paul, Paul, the most anointed man in the Bible, said, flee all youthful lust he didn't say stand in rebuke he said flee and if paul said it you better do it if paul paul the experienced most anointed man if he said it you better just do it he told young timothy flee run as if you're running from a cobra a, a venom spitting cobra run as if you are running from the most venomous snake on the face of the earth run from seduction so he ran and he said, no. And you know what? His no took him to the throne in Egypt and gave him the scepter of the wall. Power was put within his hands. And the only reason is because he said no. But had he not said no and slept with a lady, he would have ended up in prison and his head would have been taken off and we would not have a Joseph to remember. But thank God for the people that have the God-given strength and courage to say no to sin in the face of sin. God will honor you and elevate you to a position that you have never even dreamed of. Vashti said no. It was a God-inspired no, I tell you that. She said, no, I'm not coming. And the king was furious because not only has he been dishonored, but now he's afraid that all the women are going to emulate, uh, you know, emulate her, are going to imitate her, and every man is going to start disobeying the husband. So he had to take a decision. And instead of cutting her head off, he demoted her from being queen. And that's where we come to chapter 2. What are we talking about? It's your time now. But before I get to that, I want to show you that though the book of Esther does not have the name of God in it, I want to show you that everything in the book is governed and orchestrated and arranged by God. 
which is a message to you and me that when we are in the center of his will, he'll arrange everything to put you in the place he wants you to be. Stay with me. And don't you ever take your eyes off what God is about to say to you. Esther chapter 2, please. Verses 1 to 4. After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she had done, and what had been decreed against her. Now, this is four years after that day, he got wild and, and threw it out, uh, uh, you know, of her a queenship. And, and, you know, just isolated her. Now, you may wonder, why four years? Because he was busy, you know, arranging the war with Greece, which he was defeated in. It was unsuccessful. The, Greek, the Greeks defeated him. And so now he's looking to, you know, just relax after that, you know, terrible battle which he was defeated in. And so he's now looking for a place to just get his, his composure back. And so verse 2 says, Then the king's servants who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Sushan, the citadel, into the women's quarters under the custody of Higai, the king's eunuch, custodian of the women, and let beauty preparations be given them. Then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This thing pleased the king, and he did so. Okay, so there is going to be an empire-wide beauty contest. That's why I say this man's crazy. Watch this. Some smart Alex in the group said, you know, king, let's have a beauty contest over this, you know, 120 provinces or your entire empire. Let beautiful young virgins come from all over the world, you know, and let them, what we have today, you know, Miss Universe, Miss World, this is that time Miss Persia. All right? Or let's say Miss World because, you know, the whole empire was coming together. And listen to this. They had to pick one from 25 million women. 25. You got it. One beautiful woman out of 25 million beautiful women. How did this man do that? It blows my mind. Because I tell you, if you keep running your eyes from one beautiful woman to another, by the time you reach 100, you'll be tired. You'll want to give up and die and go to be with the Lord. <laughs> you'll say, oh my God, too many. <laughs> too many to choose from. One looks better than the other and the other looks better than the other one. But not this man. <laughs> 25 million, that's 2.5 crows for your kind information. 2.5 crows of women to choose from and out of that 400 were chosen and the fi final round of the 400 who were chosen they were given one year to beautify themselves my god <laughs> one year. i think that is unnecessarily long beautification process six months in this oil and then the other six months in other oils and all kinds of, you know, <laughs> creams and uh, whatnot. Oh, I mean, <laughs> that's it. it. It was, you know, 12 long months they had to, you know, get these ladies beautiful, get them up and get them good. Got to teach them, you know, royal etiquette, you know, how to handle yourself in court and all that. 12 months and verse 16. Let's go to verse 16 now. So Esther was taken among the 400. She was there and her time came. Somebody say, my time is now. Oh, uh, you got to say it like you really are expecting it to be any time now. Say, my time is now. Watch this. So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tebet in the seventh year of his reign. Now watch this. The king loved Esther 
more than all the other women and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins so he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti after 2.5 or 25 million women had crossed his eye finally one person caught his eye you know who that person was she was the person that God chose an orphan Jewish girl to become the queen, the wife of King Ahasuerus, Xerxes. Watch this. An obscure Jewish orphan, a child of the exiled, conquered people, is now exalted to the highest position that any woman could ever have attained to in the entire world of that time and one obscure hidden unknown jewish orphan a child of the exiled nation of israel a child of conquered people they were his captives but now the captive has become the queen who but god alone can do this my church let me tell you this is no coincidence this is providence there is a power working here greater than Ahasuerus am I right yes or no there is a power working right now on your behalf that is greater than all the world put together and that power is working for your good say it's my time now it's my time to be elevated it's my time to be blessed it's my time to get favor it's my time to cast the eye of the employer it's my time to cast the eye of the groom it's my time to cast the eye because God chose me for such a time as this. There's a power at work providentially, my brothers and sisters, orchestrating his own purposes through the affections of this emperor. I came to tell you tonight, when it comes to your life, God is still in control. I said when it comes to your life, God is still in control. I said when it comes to your life, God is still in control. But God does arrange things in a certain order so that his purpose and plan and destiny for your life can be achieved. God arranges things in such a way that his plan, his purpose, and his destiny for your life can be achieved. I'm glad I serve a God who has given me a purpose. His purpose, his plan, his destiny is over my life. I'm excited about the times I live in. I don't, vote for pe I don't wait for people to love me. I know I'm loved by God. I'm loved by, my, by God, dark and all. I'm loved by God, handsome and tall. I'm loved by God, whether you think so or not. Let me tell you this. God will have people act out of character. Watch this. God will make people act out of character in order to put you where you need to be. Mm. Watch this, watch this, watch this. You need to understand, you've got a boss who is in God's hand this morning. For some of you that have been complaining about your boss, I came to tell you, you got a boss who thinks he is running things, but God sent me to tell you, God is running him. So stop praying that fire will fall on his head. Don't do that. He might be thinking is he's running things, but let me tell you today, watch this. He might be thinking he's running things, but God is running him. Amen? Lift your voice and say, it's my time. Do you believe that? It's my time now. God is getting ready 
to make people act crazy in order to slip you in the job he wants you to have. God is going to make people act crazy and they will wonder why they behaved like the way they did. They're going to say, I don't know why I said that. Well, because God had you in mind, not them. Oh my God, I feel a breakthrough coming today. I said I feel a breakthrough coming today. Some folks are appointed, my brothers and sisters, but others are anointed. Some folks may be appointed, but you are anointed. And when God gets ready to move the anointed, he'll just flip the script. Touch your neighbor and say, he's turning it in my favor. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He's turning it in your favor. I wish I had a witness in here. Let me tell you this. Tell the person next to you, something's getting ready to happen. Somebody is getting ready to be elevated to the highest position. I said somebody is getting ready to move into a new position. Somebody is getting ready to move into a new job. God is getting you ready. Vashti acted out of character. Now he could have killed her, but he divorced her. Why? So that God could put Esther in place. Now watch this. I say this in close. We'll continue next week. Don't miss next week. If I was you, I will not miss the conclusion of this message. My God, you're going to be really elevated. God puts Esther in place. Esther, a Hebrew name is Hadassah, which means a plant. The name Esther is the Persian name, which means star. God is still looking for women who are willing to be stars. God is looking for people today, men and women, who are still willing to be stars for God. Amen? Everybody say, I am a star. Now, I don't want you to go thinking on superstar and mega star. All right? I don't know what other stars are there now. But I tell you what. I am a God star. I am a God star. Listen, listen, listen. Watch this. Esther was a star for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, Esther was a star for a covenant God. Watch this. She was a healing force in a nation that was falling apart. I wonder if you're... God's healing force in nations that are falling apart. I, I, I wonder, I wonder if you are God's healing force church to bring moral morality in the place of decadence and degeneracy. I wonder if you are God's star this morning. Watch this, watch this. She was a beacon of hope for the people that had lost their hope. She was a beacon of hope for the people that had lost their hope. Watch this. She was a voice of truth to a nation that had forgotten what truth is. My brothers and sisters, God is calling us to be a star today. A beacon of hope to the hopeless. An oasis of comfort to the comfortless. An oasis of help to the helpless. An oasis of power to the powerless. An oasis of healing to the sick. An oasis of joy to the sorrow. You are God's star for today. Are you willing to make the transition and be the voice of truth to a people that have forgotten what truth sounded like? Listen. She was one woman who was getting ready to change the course of history. She was one woman getting ready, that was getting ready, who was getting ready to change the course of history. Somebody say a star. Say it again, please, a star. 
Now you got to know something about the star. Stars shine. Am I right about that? But you also got to know this. Stars cannot shine until it's dark. Stars cannot shine until it's dark. And God has called you and I to shine. Stop whining and start shining. Stop complaining and start shining. Stop saying, God, I don't know why you're making me wait so long. You, I don't know. I've been praying and fasting and I've been doing all this. Stop whining and start shining. God's got a greater purpose than you think you have. And if you'll just give in to what God has for you, I'm telling you, you are going to be elevated to such a high position that you are going to be shocked beyond words that you, a person in oblivion, has moved to the highest position in, in aristocracy and you are brought to the place because now you can show to the world that you have been decorated and adorned with divine royalty. High five your neighbor and say, shine please, shine. Oh, come on, find the other person on the other side. If you didn't give them a hand, say, shine, please, shine. Yeah, shine until, until all chains of sin is broken. Shine until the flesh is crucified and your spirit is made alive. Shine until demons tremble and shackles are broken. Shine until the glory of God hits you and through you hits the world. Shine until immorality is put into the closet and locked forever. Shine until hell is broken and God's kingdom is established. Shine until God on the throne is able to smile through you in a world that's broken. Shine! 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 Shine, stars of God. Shine. For it's your time now. It's your time now. And your shining will start when you say no to the devil so that you can say yes to God. Let's rise to our feet. Hallelujah.